I am so, so, so thrilled to be here with this amazing panel. Uh, welcome to Local Matters. Uh, the panel, as you know, and as the introduction probably told you, is about music scenes and community building. Uh, we want to take our time here to really talk about the success stories in some thriving local communities and tease out what is it that they're, that they're doing right. And what can we do in terms of all kinds of infrastructure to build more thriving local communities? So I'm going to introduce our panelists really briefly and uh, jump into some questions. So uh, should I start with you, Rhymefest? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Rhymefest is a hip hop artist from Chicago. His first album, Blue Collar, was released in 2006. And he co-wrote Kanye West's Grammy-winning song, Jesus Walks. Pretty awesome, pretty awesome. <laughs> yes. Rhymefest is also a community activist and a political candidate. He ran for, for Alderman of Chicago's 20th district in an election that took place earlier this year. Pretty cool. Next to Rhymefest is Brandy Doyle. Brandy is the policy director at the Prometheus Radio Project, um, which is many. Yeah, give it up for Prometheus if you know them. That's right, that's right. <laughs> As many of you know, they're the advocate for low power FM community radio. Uh, along with the Future of Music Coalition and a broad coalition of allies, Prometheus coordinated the effort to pass the Local Community Radio Act, which uh, was signed last year after a 10-year struggle to expand community radio. Thank you for being here. Next, we have Ashley Keaton. Ashley practices entertainment and intellectual property law, and she's an adjunct professor of law at Tulane Law School, and also an adjunct professor of arts law at the University of New Orleans. She co-founded a project to provide free legal services to artists and musicians, which is called the Entertainment Law Legal Assistance Project, ELLA, and she runs another pro bono legal clinic through the organization Sweet Home New Orleans. Good up for Ashley. Next we have Craig Havighurst. Craig is a writer and filmmaker based in Nashville. And he is the founder of String Theory Media, which is a boutique documentary company specializing in music. He's produced, directed, and ed edited projects with a number of amazing musicians. And he's also a veteran journalist in radio and in print. Currently, he's the co-host of a weekly radio series called Music City Roots. Craig. Next to Craig is Bruce Fife. Bruce is the International Vice President of the American Federation of Musicians, and he's also president of, of his AFM Local 99 in Portland, Oregon. He is also a founding member of the Oregon Alliance to Reform Media, and he's engaged in a variety of media projects and music projects on the national level, as well as in his hometown of Portland. Bruce. Is Shannon hiding back down there? Hi, Shannon. <laughs> Shannon Doubt is the deputy director at the Western States Arts Federation, WESTAF. Uh, it's a regional arts organization that works to strengthen arts infrastructure through policy, research, and technology. She has served on boards of organizations representing a wide range of artistic disciplines, both nationally and in her home city of Denver. <laughs> Shannon. So I wanted to kick the panel off by getting a couple of really inspiring examples of local creative communities that are thriving, or they're growing, or they're innovating, or something really deep is happening in that local community. So I'm going to ask a couple of you to answer that question. And I'll start with Craig, because you're from Nashville, and Nashville is a place many people think of when they think of a thriving music scene. What's, what's going on in Nashville? Well, it's kind of a paradox, isn't it? I mean, people come to Nashville to get uh, exposure to the wider world, by and large. They come to pursue careers. They don't go mostly to base themselves as local musicians. And only in the last five, six years has what some of us used to call the Nashville curse kind of uh, been dealt with and, and dispelled in the media uh, so that rock bands can go to Nashville to find management, uh, seek publishing deals, uh, find the kind of infrastructure support and record and, and make their first records there and base there and not be, um, uh, you know, sort of dismissed by the, by the wider media as, as a, uh, the wrong kind of act coming out of Nashville. I think we've got a really, we've made our case, the city's made its case uh, that, that all kinds of music are coming out of there and there's a, a, a relatively new Nashville Music Council um, that is trying to support that and, and tell the world in, in a lot of ways that uh, the city is a diverse music city. Um, 
but there are, there are local scenes, and they come and they go, and they have sort of bubbles here and there, and sometimes they overlap a little bit. And I think that the, probably the most vibrant and exciting and local feeling uh, of the last few years has basically uh, gone on over, over in East Nashville, a neighborhood that was over the river, uh, just a little, you know, way off the music row kind of world. And it's, um, it's indie, it's, it's folky, it's bluegrass, it's uh, and just a kind of hybrids and... Um, People like Elizabeth Cook and Tim Carroll live over there, and uh, Eric Brace, who used to live here in D.C. and write for the Post and l led the band Last Train Home, moved down there. And uh, there is a guitar builder who works out of his shop, and there's a club called the Five Spot that is, you know, usually stocked with local musicians. And on Wednesday night, they have an old-time string jam that turns into a uh, pretty awesome, uh, you know, blowout jam all night. You know, that goes way into the into the night. And it really is colorful, and, and uh, it's a place that people just go, and they overwhelmingly say they feel the, the support of community. They learn their craft of songwriting and playing by osmosis. They get sideman gigs with other people. It, it genuinely is just like an ecosystem, and it's really, it's really rolling right now. It feels really good. Nice, great, thank you. So Nashville's obvious. I know Shannon wants to answer this question. She's from Denver, less obvious. Tell us why Denver is a thriving community. Great, thank you. Uh, so at West Staff, we have a research project called Creative Vitality Index, and it measures the relative health of different sectors of the creative economy. And um, we were looking at Denver's uh, CVI uh, data and saw that the music data was like through the roof. Um, very, very high uh, economic impact of Denver's music sector. So this kind of piqued our in interest. We did some supplemental research, both qualitative and quantitative, to really look at what was going on in Denver and why these numbers were so strong. When I talk about these numbers, it's employment numbers, it's uh, CD so store revenues, it's uh, music instrument revenues, nonprofit uh, performing arts revenues, uh, for-profit, things like that, and it was very, very strong. So um, we looked at it and uh, really kind of saw there's really incredible energy and momentum going on in Denver. And so what West Half did is we formed a music task force of leaders in the music industry uh, in the city, both for-profit and non-profit, in a really good kind of ecosystem. We had music bloggers, music lawyers, uh, musicians, and, and the like, and non-profit presenters, and convened them to really kind of explore how can we help uh, really expand on the strength that we see in Denver, because there's a lot of momentum going on. So what West Ham did with our task force is we did a music summit uh, in December and it had a kickoff concert, it had a policy symposium that really looked at how can we strengthen this community of artists. And this is both how do we give artists the skills that they need to be able to advance and how do we also provide the infrastructure for the music ecosystem and the business uh, pieces that are needed to really make the musicians be able to thrive in the city. Uh, so we um, explored that in the symposia and then we also provided technical assistance for uh, musicians, both kind of you know, new musicians and those that were established that were ready to kind of start touring. Um, in Denver, you know, it's very geographically isolated. And so a lot of our musicians have trouble getting out there on the road and knowing how to do that and do it successfully. Uh, so one of the recommendations that has come out of this is for support to help artists start to be able to tour in the West. And in the West, they, the, our whole region kind of faces this issue of geographic isolation and it's 12 hours from one major city to the other in many cases. Uh, so West Half is now working on a program to help fund artists begin to tour and to kind of get their tour legs, if you will, and start establishing markets uh, within our region so that they can be more successful. So it's been a really great project to work on. Our um, arts community and our music community is um, very cohesive and very strong, and we're really just excited to be able to help uh, from kind of a policy level uh, support their efforts and really grow and expand. That's great, Shannon, thank you. I wanted to ask you too, Rhymefest, um, you know, could you talk a little bit about what's going on in Chicago or, or maybe even a, another community where there may be uh, you know, a, a hip hop community that's really supporting the neighborhoods and the young people? Well, you know, if you look at the history of Chicago, Chicago is the home of the blues and, and everything in Chicago seems to be kind of homegrown. Uh, it's, 
It's also the home of movements. So when you look at Barack Obama organizing where he learned to get his, his political legs with Chicago, well, this is also true with music. I would say that hip-hop-wise, Chicago is the consciousness of hip-hop. I mean, look at the artists. Lupe Fiasco, Kanye West, Rhyme Fest, Common. You know, the, this yeah. is not by accident. It, it is kind of what our city breeds, are these kind of conscious street urchins, you know. And uh, this movement is still going on. One of the reasons you haven't seen the next artist blow up out of Chicago is because for artists to come out of Chicago, you have to, to be respected. You have to have a mixture of both community, political, and street. And to get that perfect mixture is, is very difficult unless you're the one, you know, mm -hmm. unless you have the it. And, and so one of the things that's happening other than hip hop, we look other places, there's a guy named Kevin Koval, Kevin Koval who does a, a, a poetry slam called Louder Than a Bomb. And this has caught on nationally. And high school uh, young people around the city prepare all year. And they get like special coaches. They bring in poetry experts. And they, they train these young people all year for this louder than a bomb poetry slam. And it means everything to them. They keep their grades up. They get their grades to be better, to be involved with this louder than a bomb competition. And just to see young people be involved and something other than rap or singing, to see them involved in poetry mm -hmm. is, is very inspirational. And, and so now we're seeing in Chicago things other than hip hop in the form of, of different music and arts uh, take a precedence. You know, the University of Chicago is creating a multi million dollar art center in the middle of a, of a de deprived community. Actually, the community I ran for a city council meeting, and the University of Chicago is creating a multi-million dollar art center, so we're looking forward to what they can produce from there. And we're also trying to uh, combine community activism. I created a program called POP, Power of Purpose, which uh, I teach young people civics and community organizing through creating their own song, so, and conflict resolution as well. So. Uh, when they are in a corner, when they feel depressed, instead of listening to Lil Wayne or Gucci Man, they can listen to their own theme song for their life, uh, and, and it can help them as a guide through their own life. So lives. So this is, these are just a few various things that myself, as well as others around the city are doing. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you. It's so nice to hear the success stories, and I'm sure there's people in the audience who are just itching to tell us about, about yours. You can shout it out if you think your city's a, a thriving creative community. DC, Boston, Austin, Brooklyn, Nashville, some more. All right, all right. Well, we'll have we'll have conversation time at the end where we can hear about all of your communities. Um, so I wanted to ask, I wanted to follow up on that because you know we all know that to have a thriving community, creative community, really we need to have artists who are thriving, um, and that means getting paid, right? <laughs> Which is oftentimes a problem, right? I wanted to ask Bruce if you could talk about a little bit your work and kind of how does a musicians' union. Um, advocate for a living wage for artists, and could you talk about your, your fair trade music campaign a little bit? Sure. Well, as the union, I consider my job to encompass two components. One is that we certainly work for our membership, of course, but also oftentimes what's most important is to work for the greater musician community as well. So there are often many times where we don't differentiate between whether you're a member of the union or not. There's an issue, we need to go out and see if we can fix it. And obviously, wages uh, for emerging artists in the club scene, there's not a city in, in the United States, I don't think, that doesn't suffer from this same issue. Didn't always used to be. We used to get paid for what we did out there, and now um, the musicians are actually last in line to get paid after everybody else gets paid, and we think that's a problem. So we, um, we actually put together a, a pretty good ongoing revolving group of musicians to talk about this issue and over the last couple of years eventually created something that we call fair trade music. It's a simple concept. It flows off the fair trade model and the, and the, the elevator speeches when you pay your five bucks at the door that money actually ought to get to the artist uh, not to just the club or the sound man or the doorman who all get paid 
generally speaking, before the band sees anything. But what in the development of this, and, and trust me, we went through everything. We had bomb throwers on one side on how to approach the issue and the kumbaya on the other. But what we came up with actually it was in the middle, which was this is a, an effort to both lift the clubs and the musicians. So what we created is this, when a, when a venue is, is, uh, is determined to be a fair trade music participating venue, they agree to a certain minimum wage scale for the musicians based on a lot of variables, which I won't go into right now. Um, then, then we, as the union and as the community that we are building out there, will support that venue because they're supporting the musicians. So we're creating a network of support organizations, whether it be uh, the Cascade Blues Association, Jobs with Justice, uh, the labor movement in general, music stores, uh, other bands. We are trying to develop a support community for supporting those venues that support the musicians. I think that's it in the nutshell. Sir. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I wonder on that also if there are any other great stories from the panel about kind of ways that partnerships with businesses or creative uses of technology or other innovative systems have really uh, increased the, the revenue that artists are getting and their ability to, to make a living doing this work. Well, there's a, there's a group in Chicago called, there's a group in Chicago called the Cool Kids, uh -huh. and they signed a record deal with Mountain Dew. And, you know, Mountain Dew sells soda. They don't sell records. So what Mountain Dew did was they said, you can have 100% of the revenue that you make off the album. You can have 100% of your royalties. Uh, all we want to do is sell Mountain Dew. So, you know, we want the Mountain Dew brand. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think as artists move forward, uh, what we're seeing is more artists are signing up with corporations that sell products and not uh, necessarily records. And, and they're, they're selling products. Uh, and, and I think especially when you look at hip hop, 98% of everything rappers talk about is a product. Uh, it's, it's a commercial, you know. But, but, but hopefully if we can encompass some a balance of conscious ideas in that as well, then, then this will be helpful. I don't think artists should have the expectation of selling records. I, I don't, it's, unfortunately, it's an outdated um, way to go about things. Artists have to concentrate more on brand and branding and who are they as a group or individual. Unfortunately, this isn't something Marvin Gaye or Stevie Wonder had to worry about, but this is something that today's artist has to worry about. And, and, and branding is in I, I, what my, my friend from Nashville was talking about is in your shows. I mean, the, you can have the greatest music in the world, but if people aren't seeing you, you have to make a certain amount of impressions. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sometimes those impressions you have to make for free before the money comes. And so uh, there was, there's a saying, do what you love and the money will come. And if it doesn't come, then you still have love. It's just like teachers. Teachers don't get paid what they should. Artists don't get paid what they should, but if you love your craft, then I think that the, it'll shine through and you'll eventually get what you deserve. Let, I, I think this is probably, is this working? Yeah. Yes, it's working, sorry, I can't hear anything. Um, this is probably a good segue for me to talk about, um, since you spoke of branding, HBO and, and Treme, and I'd like to talk more about what we were speaking about earlier, but before we get into the community building, then I would like to um, um, sort of hit what you were saying. And, and again, with, with HBO, what they have done is partner with the local music community and work directly with myself and others um, proactively to ensure that the local musicians in New Orleans and in the greater New Orleans and Louisiana area are pocketing from the use of their music and so that they are actually compensating the people, um, the content creators in our area as opposed to outside of it. And because of that, they're creating this, you know, huge revenue stream that was not existing before. But more importantly, they're, they're, in, they're reinforcing the importance of maintaining your business, of establishing your business and maintaining your business and, and driving home that if you do keep everything in order and you do um, avail yourself of access to resources, then you can monetize from your, your content. And that's something that is not, I think that's something that's presumed in many communities, but is not necessarily 
um, it's not necessarily present in New Orleans because I would argue that in our cultural uh, economy numbers would suggest that per capita, we probably have the largest talent pool in the country, maybe in the world, with the exception of Vienna, but we don't have a music business infrastructure. So when an entity like HBO comes to town and is proactive, when David Simon and Eric Obermeyer say, you know, we want to, you know, they call, we want to use this person's music, who are they contracted with? How much are they going to get paid? You know, we're going to pay them this. How much are they really going to get paid? How long is it going to take them to get paid? Are they actually going to pay them? Are you going to have to go to court over it? Do they have anything that's free and clear? And because of that, our musicians have monetized. And after that series ends, and you know, it will someday, then my hope is that the, the legacy that they've helped establish in, you know, again, maintaining your records and, and maintaining best business practices will continue so that uh, the musicians will realize uh, uh, the fruits of, of their work. You know, put it, being able to put, put your work into commerce is something that I think we take for granted, but, but there, you know, you, you get into a recording studio and there's this product, now what do I do? And par partnering with entities like that help to, like I said, uh, establish the mechanisms for, for understanding uh, the importance of it and then, you know, establishing the means for, for executing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great work. Thank you, Ashley. I wanted to follow up on something you said, Ryan Fest, because you talked about artists being seen, right? Being seen, obviously, is a, is a key part of this. And when we talk about being seen, we have to talk about the media. Um, and I'll include the internet in the media also, right? The media, it's critical for getting spins on the radio, for getting reviews of your show, for getting any kind of publicity, um, or for being able to distribute your stuff on your own, online, right? There's, there's, there's media policy that's involved in that as well. I want to ask a couple of you, what does it really look like when you have a community media scene that's really supporting your local creative community? And maybe, maybe I'll start with Bruce, because I know that you've done a lot of work on media consolidation and on community media, and then I want to be sure we hear from Brandy next. Well, one of the other things we did, I mean, I've been very focused on, on our local artists and trying to get, you know, various exposure for them over the years, and it goes back to 2004 when, we, when I was working with other folks uh, within this organization called Oregon Alliance to Reform Media on, on, from our standpoint, getting access to radio for, for local artists, which dead end, it just dead ended at every juncture, everything we tried to do, we could not get anybody to uh, pull from the talent pool, that, and we've got a great talent pool in Portland. Every, everybody has the best scene, by the way. I think. Um, <laughs> and so, so anyway, so what we eventually did was we had an opportunity. Uh, there was a full power non-commercial educational license window that opened up. We saw a, sta uh, a frequency available. We pulled a bunch of community people together and grabbed that license. We got it. Um, we're still trying to get on the air because we're fighting with AT&T over our tower. Uh, so we're, we're, we're broadcasting through HD to a, a translator, but the focus of this radio station is local music, arts, and culture. Directly, I mean, local music is kind of broadly defined so that there's some creativity that can go into that, but um, it's a way for us to get our artists out over the airways and um, kzme.fm. It's, it's, uh, it's not where we want it, but it's on its way there. That's great, thanks. And Brandy, what can you tell us about any opportunities that might be coming up in places where there may not already be a community radio station? Sure, thanks Yolanda. Um, so as Yolanda mentioned, uh, the Local Community Radio Act was passed um, last year and signed into law uh, this January. And what that means is that the FCC now has a mandate to expand low-power FM community radio all over the country. And uh, the FCC is still in the process of implementing that law and um, creating the regulations to implement it that will then allow for an opportunity to apply for new community radio licenses nationwide. And until they finish that process, we don't know exactly when that will happen, but it seems like the earliest it will happen is next summer, um, so summer 2012. There'll be opportunities for nonprofit organizations all over the country to apply for these licenses. Um, low power stations are, um, they're, they go to nonprofit organizations, local governments, churches, schools. Um, you don't have to be a 501c3, but you, you do have to be nonprofit. And they're fundamentally local. I mean, they're, you have to be a local organization, and 
they support local um, arts and culture in ways that it, it's hard to envision, I think, if you don't have a community radio station where you are. Can I just see from the folks in the room, would you raise your hand if you have a, a community radio station in your area that you're familiar with? So a good number of folks, not most people, I would say, in the room. Um, so I, I used to work for a community radio station, uh, WMNF in Tampa, Florida, a full power community radio station. And uh, I was a volunteer news reporter. And so I know more about the news scene, but I know a little bit about the culture and the, the musical scene there as well. And I think it's a good example to talk about, even though it's, um, it's a full power station and the opportunities that are coming up are gonna be for low power stations because it's been around for 30 years. And so it gives you a sense of what's possible once these stations really become institutions in their community. And it's, it's not just the station that's an in, a cultural institution. I think there's individual programs that are institutions within those music scenes that those programs are serving. So there's a metal show that's an institution in the metal community in Tampa. There's a bluegrass show that's an institution in the, you know, in the national bluegrass scene as well as in the local bluegrass scene. And um, you know, these, these programs are supporting artists not only by getting them airtime and getting them on the air, but they're also, you know, they, they bring uh, bands in for live shows, the stations, community radio stations often support concerts throughout the year, you know, dozens and dozens of local um, shows. And then there's also the sort of more intangible, I mean, supporting that scene, having conversations about that scene, having, bringing in experts that are often the DJs are people who are, who are experts in that um, scene that have been involved in that, music critics, people who, musicians themselves who've been involved for a long time. And so it creates a sense, uh, I mean, it helps to create the scene in ways beyond just getting the, the spins that you might get on a normal commercial station. Uh, my, my favorite example at WMNF is the Florida Folk Show, which is not a scene I knew anything about until I started listening to the station. And it's a show um, that's, I think, I'm not sure how long it's been on, it's been on for years, but you know, I, I had no idea that there was a Florida folk scene before I started listening to this program. And it's not just, you know, there's songs kind of about the swamps in Florida, but there's also songs about draining the swamps and songs about, um, you know, a lot of songs critiquing uh, the development in Florida, the, the condos that are going up and the loss of local culture. And so for me, it, it's not just the way that the, the stations can support music, but also the way that the music and musicians are supporting the community at large as well and the, the way that those um, those programs and, and having that music scene on the air helps to create a sense of place um, that, that is a difficult thing. If you're from Florida, um, there's so many people in Florida that are not from Florida that to have a sense of local, um, which I think is a, a, an important thing to pull out with community radio, um, that those the shows do, do a lot to create a sense of place in ways that are intangible, I think. Yeah. That's great, thank you. Thank you also for bringing up that point about the two-way street between communities and artists and that they need to support each other, right? Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us just, Brandy, if people are interested in that opportunity for the low-power FM radio stations, where can they hear more? Sure. Um, so you can go to our website, which is prometheusradio.org, and there's a button there that says, I want to start a station that you can click on and it, you'll be signed up for updates to get more information. We do webinars and information for groups that um, that want to start stations, you can start now by um, thinking about what kind of programming you want to do, what kind of partnerships you want to have within your community to put a station together. Um, and as more information comes down from the FCC, we'll be in touch with everyone about how to get involved in applying. And this is like a one-time opportunity, right? This is not something people can drag their feet on. This is a one-time opportunity. Once they open a window for, they, they call it an application window, a filing window, um, the last one for low power stations was 10 years ago. It was five days long. Um, we don't know how long this one will be, but it's, it's a one-time thing. You need to get everything prepared in advance of the window, and then you, ha you put in your application at that time. Um, and uh, because there are so many stations on the FM band at this point, the spectrum is getting crowded, and it's unlikely that this will happen again at this scale. So this is, this is the opportunity. It's coming up in about a year. and. Um, yeah, and it's, and it's a one-time opportunity. And because it's a one-time opportunity, we really are focused at Prometheus on these licenses going to local groups and local organizations. And so we're actually pushing for a requirement for new low-power stations to do a certain number of hours of local programming, which currently is not a requirement on the station. So some, some are fantastic. A lot of the community groups do many hours per week of local programming um, and support local musicians and artists. And then some are kind of you know, getting their music from satellite 24-7. And 
that would be fine if there was an infinite number of these licenses, but there's not. It's a one-time opportunity, and there'll be competition for each available frequency, particularly in big cities. So, um, so we're really pushing that, that you know, if there's going to be scarce licenses, there's only so many groups that are going to win them, they should really go to local organizations. And so that's also something you can get involved in. Um, when that comes down from the FCC, they're going to, to do a rulemaking procedure where they decide what the new rules will be, and you have an opportunity to tell the FCC we believe that you know, in our community these scarce licenses should go to genuinely local organizations and there should be some kind of requirement for, um, because what happens now is that you have to be local, but they get around it by finding some local group to, to put their name on the license and then a national organization feeds um, syndicated programming to lots of stations across the country. And this is a, this is a huge problem um, in the low power service that we hope to eliminate by making this local programming requirement so that would, would rule out some of these national organizations. That's great, thank you. We'll get back to more policy wonkery in a minute, but first while we're on the media, I wanted to ask Craig actually if you could talk a little bit about Music City Roots and how that fits into the Nashville scene. Yeah, okay. Um, we are a, uh, a live radio show weekly, Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Central. It uh, lasts uh, almost three hours. Uh, four to five acts a week. It's a Roots Americana format, and so it's a very broad tent, um, indie folk rock to uh, bluegrass to old time. And uh, it was started, we, we're gonna, when we go back next Wednesday for our uh, fall season, uh, we'll have been on the air two years, so we're feeling good about that. Definitely started with one of those uh, do the right thing and the money will follow kind of visions. A couple guys who had backgrounds in radio ad sales uh, came to me about three and a half years ago with the, with the I outlines of the idea, and I was encouraged by the, their, their point of view as people who had a background in ad sales because they um, understood something that I'd come to understand researching the history of WSM in Nashville and its role in building the Grand Ole Opry on one hand, but also the larger recording infrastructure in Nashville, um, that uh, many of the great programs from the era of live radio were driven by the by the by uh, commercial reps by uh, people who represented the sponsors, um, and it didn't destroy the music at all. It, in fact, it it helped build uh, scenes and create uh, opportunities where there wouldn't have been. And the quintessential example being Martha White Flower and Flat and Scruggs, um, a deal that was done by Earl Scruggs' wife and 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 uh, lasted for decades and really helped. Uh, bluegrass music get known to the world. So we modeled the show explicitly on the radio, live radio of the 1930s and 40s. We, one of the tricks was we, we, we decided to do a, th a three host format. We have an MC who calls the show to order and he's a uh, veteran of the Grand Ole Opry, 30 some years. Keith Bilbrey is his name. He was let go by WSM, boo. Um, and, we've, and we uh, scooped him up because he's just absolutely perfect. He's, he's been there on that most famous country music stage. Our musical host is Jim Lauderdale, a Grammy-winning Grammy Americana singer-songwriter and a terrific artist. And uh, he's there just about every week. Um, and then uh, my role is, uh, as a third host is uh, the artist interviewer. And I, I write the script for the show, but then I'm on stage. And so as we do the swap outs of the uh, artist takes five or six minutes, we're up there in a little corner uh, with a little kind of shed set on stage um, interviewing the artist live. The show goes out uh, over Lightning 100 at WRLT-FM, a uh, locally owned radio station that's specialized over the years, calls itself Nashville's Progressive Radio. It's been a progressive rock format or sort of AAA format, uh, but they have always emphasized local artistry and so folks like back in the day Jason, Jason and the Scorchers or more recently Will Hogue, that kind of artist gets a fair amount of airplay, so we feel like we fit since we have so much Nashville music, though we're not exclusively Nashville at all. We have a lot of folks coming in and touring through. Um, we are a commercial show, and, and uh, we have our, our main sponsors are Nissan, Whole Foods, Griffin Technology, The Nature Conservancy, and most recently, Old Smoky Moonshine, <laughs> out of Knoxville, Tennessee. And um, we've got a lot of, of uh, in-kind uh, deals with uh, companies like Blackstone Brewery comes and brings beer. They sell it to the folks out there, but they, they, they let the artists Get a couple beer tickets. We have caterers, uh, local uh, food food purveyors, uh, come and do the catering for the artists. And from the very beginning, the number one emphasis was on community, on representing, reflecting, encouraging, cultivating the Nashville music scene, uh, filling a void where there had not been. We have not had any kind of uh, rep media platform for Nashville artistry since 
uh, the National Network uh, died years and years ago, and even then it was a that was a very big time country music only kind of thing back in the in the 80s, TNN was, was kind of a Nashville, uh, kind of an Austin City Limits for Nashville. And we haven't had that. We wanted to really be that. We thought that uh, if we could do that over, over um, radio and the web, uh, we might fill a, a really critical void. And we are on the web from the very first day. We, live, we, we went out over livestream.com with three cameras. We have professional director mixing you know, uh, the show on the fly. Um, we've tricked out a, a video van. That van can now travel to other events. We went to the National Folk Festival on the, in Nashville. We went out to the Bristol Rhythm and, <clears throat> Bristol Rhythm and Roots and live streamed from there. We've live streamed house parties that are, that are contest uh, prizes for, um, for fans and, you know, serve the Blackstone beer and have a, a, one of our, you know, sort of friendly bands play. <clears throat> and, um, you know, of course we're active on all the social networks. We've got about 11,000 followers on Twitter now and uh, about 9,000 likes on Facebook. And, but in, uh, the live stream tr traffic, when I looked it up, really, ki really kind of impressed me. We're looking at about sort of between two and 500 people are watching during the show, but then during the week, there are anywhere between four and 20,000 streams uh, of the show, which have been archived back going about a year. Um, and uh, we, apparently the website's been visited by about 121 different countries. We're very eager to invite um, international roots musicians to come and play. Uh, we've had some you know, folks from Ireland and uh, just we're looking, for, we're looking for more opportunities. There's not, it's not as common as we'd like, but we, we, we're really trying to throw this thing to the, to the globe and invite the globe back. And um, so I think that one of the things that we've, we've noticed is that by treating the artists uh, really well and giving them a great hang, um, they find it a place that's becoming kind of a, uh, some of them are coming every week just to hang out and they'll get up on the stage at the end of each show, all the artists get up there and Jim will kind of, will lead the Loveless Jam. We're out of the Loveless Cafe, it's a, there's a, I meant to explain this, the Loveless Cafe is a barn built by the Loveless Cafe people about three years ago. Uh, the Loveless had been a kind of roadside fried chicken and biscuits place. It's in all of the tourist uh, literature about Nashville and all the travel features say go to the Loveless. It's kind of out of town a little bit, um, hence our motto, we come to you from the edge of Music City. And uh, it's, it's been just unbelievably fun. It's like it, it does feel like reading what I've, what I've read and heard about the, the Opry in the 1940s and 50s when it was pure community that also happened to be on the national uh, you know, airwaves and uh, building uh, star careers. And I'm not sure we've created any stars yet, but we're definitely giving exposure and, and, uh, and a lot of love and support uh, to those artists. Those artists, for example, can easily create a tab on their Facebook page with a live stream uh, window that they, you know, so a fan can watch it straight off the Facebook page. And um, we really rely on the artists to, you know, help sell the barn out. We, you know, between that's a four to five, six hundred people a week in the in the venue, and um, and to tell people by Twitter, to, you know, we're live now. Can check it out or. We had this thing. We also put most of the performances up as isolated pieces on YouTube. So, you know, we're pushing and pushing and pushing, and uh, we're having a lot of fun doing it. So if I can ask Great. you other questions about it, but that's kind of the overview. Great. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, so we are getting close to our question period or, or conversation period if folks want to talk about their communities. But there are, there, there are so many questions I didn't get a chance to ask. Um, there's one that I, I can't not ask. Uh, when we talk about supporting local communities. So I'm going to do that and just ask folks to keep their answers brief on this one so we can um, talk with the rest of the folks in the room. But the question is about policy, right? What, what do we need to do to set up the right policies that are going to help these communities thrive? And they're on so many levels, right? They're on the funding level, on um, media policy, on you know so many noise ordinances, all kinds of stuff. And it's on the local level and on the state level and on the national level. And there's so much to do on policy. Um, can we call it just a couple of those things? Quick, and maybe I'll start with Shannon. Uh, sure. You know, the Westaf works with local or public sector arts agencies, so city and state arts agencies, and they have no money at all. Um, they're getting cut. Their budgets are getting cut. State and local budgets you know, are just diminishing rapidly. Uh, and we're in increasingly in a small government kind of environment where, you know, investing in the public good uh, is seen as a low priority. It's wrong, but that's, that's where we're at. So, you know, in terms of like, 
huge cash investments uh, from public sector, I, I don't see that changing in the future. We like to say we're in the new normal now. Um, but I think that you know public sector policymakers can play a really important role in non-cash support for developing local music scenes. So whether that's um, building strong networks of musicians and music um, business people uh, so that you're, you're really strengthening the, the group and so there's a lot more collaboration and people are seeing different opportunities. Um, you know, technical assistance, professional development, all of those kind of things can really go far to help, I think, um, music industries thrive within cities. Um, I, I also would say that public sector agencies also have access to highlighting, uh, you know, works on the national level for, you know, we've got this really strong music scene in Denver. Uh, you know, the, um, that can go to national conferences and things like that, or here. Uh, and also the access to the press. So I think that there are things that, uh, that policymakers can do to really support uh, you know, strengthening music businesses and music sectors, uh, but there's not a lot of cash, unfortunately, uh, to help that happen. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you, thank you. Ashley, could you talk a little bit about some of the policy initiatives you're working on? Um, sure, um, first of all, I'm just going to say, in New Orleans, we, we consider ourselves one of the most thriving music communities, and, and we're very proud of that and vocal about it, and I think we are. And to touch on the radio, I mean, if, if, you, if you live there, if, you, if you've been there, you can't drive down the street without seeing WWOZ stickers, that are our, our um, local radio station. And it's more three-pronged, where you have you know, the community that supports the station, the station that supports the musicians, the musicians that support the, the, uh, the station. And, and that's just one example. Our policy, I think, citywide, is to support our music community. And whether that's from the nonprofit sector or the um, city or the or some of the uh, for-profit sectors, but the musicians have kind of taken the you know have have taken have taken their put it in their own hands, so to speak, and because they've had to. And what we do is support them. And so the again, the overarching policy is to make it a viable community, a viable place for them to continue to live. And I've been working with the mayor's office, for example, on eliminating, not eliminating, on amending a noise ordinance that's unconstitutional that prohibits musicians from playing in the French Quarter past 8 p.m. And it specifically targets musicians. And the mayor's office appointed a task force and, and I led the revisions to that. And it's been met uh, with very positive reception. It's up for pu public comment. We're going to do some more amendments and we're working on similar um, ordinances um, pertaining to visual arts. There's a lot of nonprofit involvement um, supporting um, and the local musicians. The Tiptinas Foundation uh, supplies instruments. Sweet Home New Orleans supplies um, um, some social services and you know I have uh, the free legal services programs that I've co-founded. You can't really go into New Orleans without meeting people who support the music community. I mean I asked someone yesterday um, in downtown DC where I could find some free music literature and, and we have three magazines you know so and you know the, the uh, most well known is Offbeat and, and it, it's just it's Again, most of it's grassroots, but we are truly community. And if it weren't for the overarching policy of, of continuing to uh, further the, the, the arts, and in particular the music and the legacy of it, that it's, you know, I mean, we're the birthplace of jazz. And I don't care what anyone says, we are. <laughs> because it started there, and then it had to go up the river, and, and you all just weren't there yet. So, so, so you, you, we can argue that till the cows come home. But, uh, but at any rate, you know, we, there's a lot, there is a lot of effort and, and again, you know, there's a lot of, the, the overarching policy is keep our musicians here, keep them thriving and whether it's for-profit, non-profit, um, grassroots, you know, independent, whatever it is, you know, we're doing what it takes to make sure that, that we continue to um, provide you all with a place to come and, and see our live local music and our great talent. That's great, thank you. And Remkes, you took this whole policy advocacy thing to another level and actually ran for office, yes. which is interesting. And I wonder, can you tell us about what, why is it important for artists to actually be in those decision-making roles? 
because artists are creatives, and right now, when there's not a lot of money in the budget, we need creative solutions to common problems. Uh, I like to, and in, 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 in showing you how media deals with artists, I like to show a brief clip sure, yeah. uh, of my run for office. All right. I'm going to press play. I'm assuming this thing is on. Yes. Thumbs up. A Grammy Award winning rapper named Shay Rhymefest Smith. Shay Rhymefest Smith. Shay Rhymefest Smith. Shay Rhymefest Smith. Is announcing his candidacy for Alderman of the 20th Ward. I'm Shay Rhymefest Smith, and today I've come downtown to file my petitions for my run as Alderman of the 20th Ward. Why am I running for Alderman? If my son can't be safe in the community, why would we even call it a community? It's not a community. How many people know somebody within the last five years who's been shot? Raise your hand. Tell me what we came here for. We're not scared of our block no more. In the 20th Ward, this is the ward that snakes from back of the yards through Englewood to Woodlawn and Washington Park. Hip-hop artist Che Reinfest Smith is trying to win against the incumbent, former police sergeant Willie Cochran. And joining the fray there is George Davis, a lawyer with an MBA, along with Andre Smith and Sidney Shelton. Rapping, being women, shooting at relatives, does not what, what do I say to my contemporaries who say, why are you supporting a rapper? When I hit the block, I think you know the sign. Okay. I'm rapping and I'm politicking, dog, that's overtime. I would say that in a democracy, the criteria of service to common good and public life is not confined certain to a small slice of profession. just arresting him right. because Andre Smith called the police. There's a misdemeanor weapons charge and a domestic battery yes. charge in your past. I don't understand why the press can't concentrate on the issues of the war. Okay, now, Chase won it by 20 votes on that one. Up. Now, I'm getting an affidavit from her right now. Yes. With the record that Mr. Smith has, he wouldn't even be able to get a clearance to go in the Capitol. Me and my son walk these streets, and they call me a gang member, and I have to put my family's life at risk. So one of the things that we saw with, with my election, yeah. oh, thank you. One, one of the things that we saw with my campaign is that arts was put on trial. Uh, rap music, I, I mean, I don't know Lil Wayne, but I was, had to answer for all of his songs. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and how do you convince a 75-year-old woman that she should vote for a rapper? Uh, we, what, what ended up happening was we pushed the incumbent into a runoff. So, it, I mean, it sounds like a bad joke. The, the rapper, the reverend, the police officer, and the lawyer. <laughs> and so I, we got rid of the reverend and the attorney, and it was just the police officer against the rapper, which was very interesting in itself because they're antithetical to each other. So, so, so now we push the incumbent into a runoff, and everyone is now taking me as a serious candidate and not a novelty. The reason that the media came out to cover uh, my election is because they thought that I would fall on my face, not understand policy, be what the mainstream perception of a rapper is, and didn't realize that the arts community does have creative solutions to common problems. So, you know, uh, we lost by 250 votes out of thousands and thousands and thousands of votes in the depressed community. Yeah. But now, this, this was the beginning. This was the first rapper to ever have a viable political campaign. And, and the very interesting thing is that I wasn't supported by artists who were already elected, like Jerry the Iceman Butler, who is a councilman in Chicago. He was like, I'm not touching it. And, and, and so, what I realized is that the generational disconnection in artists has to be mended. Because you have people, and, and the cultural disconnection. So, you know, it, it would behoove me 
to understand the Nashville scene and what's going on in country music. Or what's going on in, when, when I went to New Orleans and I saw some of the best musicians in the world blind, playing the bass, playing the piano. I mean, th these people were comparable to, to the greats and I've never heard of them. But then I saw the members of Green Day go into this real low key bar in New Orleans and start to play with these older musicians and couldn't keep up. Mm -hmm. Couldn't keep up. And, and, and the musicians, they granted them a pass and, you know, you know what I mean? And, and, and so, you know, but that grew me as an artist and as a rapper and it actually those type of experiences made me more interested in my own community and how I could inspire change. I worked on a bill, HR 848, so that uh, artists could start to get royalties for when they're played on the radio. You know, one of, one of the problems one of the problems is that the radio has become the enemy to the artist. And the artist said, okay, this is what we're going to do. In my case, we create our own media. We, we go to YouTube, we go to our Twitters, we go to our Facebooks, and we do our shows. And, and you will not get a record deal by being, having good music. It's not going to happen. It's going to happen by creating a demand for yourself. And, and so, you know, uh, if, if I could get into political office and, and help artists through policy, then I think that we need revolutionaries or, or we need politicians to turn the guns off of revolutionaries while you do your work. That's right, thank you. So if anybody wants to move to Chicago, work on his campaign. You know, if I, if I could just for a second, what, what's really important I think is, is to have somebody in your community you know, a, a group, an organization, whatever, constantly looking at what's going on in that policy area, because it might be the city hall. In our case, oftentimes when the Liquor Control Commission of the state makes a change in the laws, it impacts directly the musicians, and, and, and that's a real problem. So when they made it illegal for minors to perform in clubs where it had been le legal for years, you know, you got a problem there, and you got to be able to fight those things, and you actually never know where those battles are going to come from. So. You do have to pay attention to it, and then and then approach it as a group because the government doesn't listen to one person. You gotta you gotta be there with a group. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. So, do we have time for some questions? We do. Okay, perfect. Or conversation, or you know, great anecdotes about cool things that are going on in your community. But we definitely want to broaden the discussion here. So, we've got our mic person walking around. She can flag him down. Um, I work in like digital marketing and social media, and uh, particularly what you said at the Anne Rhyme Fest, like you're not going to get a record deal by making great music. You have to make demand for yourself, and a lot of people now are doing that through social media, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and I I'm in no way arguing the effect of local radio stations and, and how they can benefit a local community, but I'm wondering how effective you think radio is in, in helping an artist become more successful, not only locally, but trying to expand out of a local scene and really make them successful on a more national level and how effective radio is for that in this day and age? Well, uh, radio is, is very effective. The problem, though, is that payola still exists and it will always exist. And it exists in the form of consultation and you know, you, you, and, and, and studies, group studies that they do. But the problem, and when they study a record to find out if this record is a viable record for the marketplace or not, is that group think then incurs. In, in so if you have a song and it doesn't sound like Drake, then the group is gonna say, well, this doesn't sound like Drake. But if you have people listen to music individually, then you'll get a whole new opinion on what they think of that song. So, you know, radio is so connected to Wall Street and the marketplace and the mainstream labels that, that unless you're in that machine, and being in that machine means you're selling a product, which is usually, in, in the case of hip hop, rims or drugs or alcohol or sex or the club or a car or whatever, or clothes then you're not going to be able to get your message out. So when you listen to hip hop on the radio, and, and you know, I've, I've recently been writing songs for a producer named Dr. Luke. And um, the thing about when you write a song for Katy Perry, or when I write a song for Kesha or something like that, you could talk about whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> like, and it was so much freedom. And, and even, but they think it sucks. 
But I'm like, wow, I don't have to talk about killing black people? Like, I don't have to talk about drug dealing? Like, really? And, and so I, I, I think my, my perspective is skewed because I rap. I think I would, I would be interested in knowing as far as a country singer. It seems to me country singers can talk about whatever they want to talk about and have a bigger chance of being played on a major radio station than hip hop, which is still stigmatized and put into a box, which I think is racist. I think it's very racist how the music industry pushes rappers to do certain things and talk about certain things because people are only going to understand certain things. They tell us, Soldier Boy is for the kids. You know, the kids understand Soldier Boy, they like that. But when I was a kid, I understood Public Enemy. I knew what they were talking about. And, and why can't my child, why can't my child have that same balanced musical diet? So, you know, I, I just think the, the box that I'm in is a racial box. And, and, and so uh, I don't see hope for radio for hip hop. Yeah, in commercial country, it's uh, uh, every time a song breaks that is not about love your kids or America, it's like a conversation <laughs> piece. Like when the, the Brad Paisley, Alison Krauss uh, uh, song, um, title, but it was a, it was a, you know, an alcohol, it was a death of an alcoholic. It was a tragic, you know, suicide story and it was narrative and it was kind of reminded everybody of what's, what country songs sounded like in the sixties and early seventies. But that was like a big sort of talking point. It's not the norm. It, 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 it it's the exception that proves the rule. Uh, whiskey lullaby. Thank you. Oh man, I got a rap real quick. So like I wrote this rap called Katie the Cutter and I'll be like, you couldn't tell it by her family or just looking at her home. She had everything she wanted, but she still felt all alone. Baby Katie was the middle child, always felt forgotten. Older brother playing ball, little sister spoiled rotten. Her mother's always zoned out, off the moxie cottons, and a hell of a life that she wished she wasn't brought in. Hell of a world that she wished she wasn't brought in. She had to do something. Her skin starts crawling. She starts cutting and she's scratching and she's peeling and she's smiling because she loved the fact she finally has a feeling and feeling like it's wrong. She covers up and hide it, acting normal, nothing's wrong. That's how she justifies it. She has a secret. She's numb to the pain, because for Katie, the first cut was the deepest. So if you see her, please tell her that you love her. She's her own favorite butcher, because her daddy used to touch her. And that's something that'll never be on the radio, but I want to rap about it. You know what I mean? The other, thing, the other thing radio does that, that's bothered me for a long time is that it, it, it used to be the music came with the story and the, and the enthusiasm and a disc jockey, you felt like somebody picked something for you and was showing it to you and sharing it with you and they would tell you some fact and there used to be, even, the, you know, even that Casey Kasem's old show where the top 40, he'd tell you a story about each song. They used to tell you who wrote the song or some little fact and now you barely get a back announce. Um, and part of our ethic with the show was we, we give, the art, give the audience a reason to listen to one more song by that, or the first song by that artist. Give them a little tale, a little story, a little background, um, and it makes an emotional connection, but radio is bereft of that. Mm -hmm. mm. I mean, I, I would say that that's one of the reasons why radio, good radio, community radio is so relevant, is that role of curation and having, having you know, when I was talking about, that's what I was trying to get, I'm talking about experts, having, having people that are, that are passionate about the music that are, are going to be able to curate something for you that you wouldn't be able to find in your own iTunes list. Uh, and, and I, but I also want to say that it's not either or. And most stations that I know are doing streaming, they're doing podcasting, they're, they've got Facebook and Twitter, and that it's supplementing and enhancing what they're doing over the broadcast, the analog broadcast airwaves. And that, um, you know, that, they, that they're experimenting. And, you know, we work with some stations that are experimenting with... Um, community Wi-Fi networks and, you know, and figuring out ways to link broadcast and broadband into to new waves. So a lot of times these community stations can be community hubs to bring people in and get them involved in new technology, which I think can support artists and musicians in different ways um, to link those things together. That's great. Thank you. Looks like we've got another hands up over here and one here. Oh, and back there. Yes. Hi, my name is uh, Bobby Hill and I'm with WPFW, which is the community station here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Appreciate that, we, and we've collaborated with w, uh, WOZ for a couple of, couple of different events. Um, but I wear another hat, which is as a presenter with Transparent Productions, presenting avant-garde jazz music. And it's just got two questions. We've been doing it for about 14 years. Eric Grace, as a matter of fact, wrote the first, first piece on us 
the first year we started doing it. Um, but my question is about the, the fair trade music designation that you were talking about. Uh, is that a designation just for um, um, performance spaces or presenters or how, how do you get that de such a designation? And, and, and the second question, because I, I know I'll be passing the mic on, the second designation is about the uh, low power community stations and um, the new public benefit corporation designation that's available for nonprofits where you can, you can be a nonprofit but also have a business uh, component if you are um, doing good things for the community. So I wonder if that qualifies for the local community broadcaster. So, so those two questions, one about the fair trade designation, who's it, who, who gets it, and a question about the um, low power and public benefit corporation. So the, the focus of fair trade music was really the club scene. I mean, that's, that's really its focus. Now, we've had signers that have signed on that have been community events and those types of things, and they were events that previously had not paid the musicians anything for, for performing at those events, and now they do, which is, a, we, you know, it's a step in the right direction. But its primary focus was, was uh, club, the club scene because what we have there is a business model. We have clubs that are making money off the services provided by the musicians and not really paying them. So that's, that's always been its focus. Um, it's not just Portland. It's starting to move outside of Portland through our network of locals. But we've also got, we just had uh, um, CD Baby did a piece on it on their do-it-yourself blog. And we keep getting connections from all over. In fact, we had a, a cover or a story in our weekly that got picked up by the Nashville scene and created quite a, a blog storm in, uh, in Nashville on it uh, about a year and a half ago. So it's, it's, but that's its primary focus. Local 1000 has start has has people signed on to it right now. There are there are non are non geographic local, and they've picked up on it and are rolling with it. Great, thanks. Do we want to hit the gentleman's question about the? Sure. So the the for the new low power FM stations, the specific eligibility requirements are still um, undecided by the FCC, um, and that'll be the focus part of the focus of the next rulemaking. That and also. Um, technical requirements for new stations. And it's a, it's a very technical policy issue. There's a lot of things about inter interference between stations and antennas and how stations are allocated. But they're really important because they're going to determine whether and where there are these stations available. And particularly if you live in mid-size or large cities, all of these technical rules that are being hashed out right now um, are going to determine whether there's going to be stations in your area. So I would encourage folks on, on that point um, and on other points uh, to get to stay involved in the issue and make your voice heard at the FCC uh, if you have particular ideas about who you think should be eligible or, um, or you know, just simply that you want there to be licenses available in your area, which is, um, we, you know, if people want to talk afterwards about some of the technical requirements, I'm happy to do that. I'm not going to go into great detail about that. But for the last round of LPFM stations, the basic requirement was that you be a nonprofit organization in whatever way is recognized by your state. You don't have to be recognized uh, by, you know, as a 501c3. But I think that there's there's room to um, to participate in, in shaping the requirements for the next round. You have to have the, the name on the license has to be a nonprofit organization that's that's recognized by your state and but you can partner and you can form collaboration. So if you're a musician uh, or, or music, you know, a group of musicians and you want to work with another civic organization and they're going to be the license holder and they're going to maybe do the news hour, but you're going to do the music hour. You can you can form collaborations with other organizations in your area and make an even stronger station. So if you don't have a license, you can partner with someone, or if you don't have a nonprofit designation, you can partner with others. You just have a you'd have a fiscal agent. Yeah. So there lots of specifics that Brandy would be happy sure. to answer for anybody who wants. And I I am so sad to say that the time for our panel is over. This has been so amazing to hear all these stories, and I think let's give a round of applause for our panelists. And let's keep clapping for, for Future Music Coalition for putting this on, because this is really why we come to a conference like this, to hear this. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody.